In traveling the country over the last 17 years, from Beijing in the north to Kunming in the south, from Shanghai in the east to Lhasa and far away Tibet, I worked up a list of ingredients for this architectural chop suey. I'd like to share that recipe here. The Chinese have always been fascinated with things Western. Heaven is not only above, it may just also be somewhere in the West. It is said that the sage Lao Tzu, the reputed founder of Taoism, did not achieve the true stage status until he was allowed entrance into the Western paradise. This love for things Western crops up in many guises in China's new urban architecture. One is the use of classical Greek and Roman forms, which, in the middle of a Chinese street, make for great moments of out-of-place architectural whimsy. Shown here is a Beijing branch of the Shanghai Pudong Development Bank. The gaps in the folded sheet metal cornice of the pseudo-classical facade speak to the quality of the construction. At larger scales, the Western classical influence is much more in your face. Shown here is a major government center in Chengdu, Xichuan province, home, by the way, of the giant panda. The building looks like a cross between St. Peter's and Rome, the capital of the United States, and possibly the rejected design for a Las Vegas casino. Another feature of current urban Chinese architecture is what I call Soviet blocks but with a twist. The Soviet Union played a large role in birthing communist China. It was a consultant to her politics. It also influenced her architecture. The 1917 Russian Revolution produced a style called Soviet constructivism. It stressed the impersonal strength of steel and concrete, the machine as a personification of the utopian state, and mass housing for workers. In its early days, the movement inspired some innovative forms, but the pragmatic outcome was blocks and blocks of anonymous boxes. China's population is currently around 1.3 billion, almost five times that of the United States. Mass housing blocks are therefore a necessity in China. You see them everywhere, and a density is rarely found in the U.S. But what makes the newer ones noteworthy is that they are a mix of the original Soviet mass housing which expresses impersonal collectivism with something that must look attractive, which is an outcome of capitalist investment. After all, new housing in China is not government issued. You have to buy it, and for a pretty sum at that. The result is something that looks like this in Jinzhou, a city near the new Three Gorges Dam area. The development retains the anonymity of block housing, but it also has a sheen of the picturesque. The white walls and colorful roofs hark back to the color palette of historic Chinese architecture in this region. The balusters along the water and the arched stone bridge look like they came out of an emperor's garden. Soviet blocks are different from just blockism. The common features of blockism are buildings comprised well of large oversized blocks. They have a simple-minded toy building block quality to them. Often the blocks are just juxtaposed in unsubtle and ungracious ways. These buildings invariably look very brutish. I think of them as building blocks on steroids. Here is a blockish, brutish hotel in a city named Da Zhu in central China. Note the Darth Vader-like penthouse. This blockish look can be found in any Chinese city. In my view, Blockism comes out of several factors. One is total discontinuity with China's architectural past. The other is the attempt to connect with the international architectural scene. These monolithic forms, then, represent an attempt by Chinese designers to engage in the modernist conversation they were excluded from for most of the 20th century. For millennia, Chinese architecture has typically been of one-story construction. Hence, it is horizontal more than vertical resonating with the lay of the land in a historically agrarian culture. The enduring signature of this horizontal architecture is the Chinese roof. The Japanese commentator Wan Nichiro Tanizaki likens this roof to an elegant canopy suspended from the sky. The subtle curves of the roof line resolve in upturned eaves which gracefully shed the rain while allowing sunlight into interior recesses.
The Chinese roof is one element which has survived the tumultuous 20th century. Neither Marx nor Lenin nor Mao nor laissez-faire capitalism has succeeded in erasing the memory of the Chinese roof. And this finds expression in two ways in the current building boom. One is simply plopping the roof down atop any building of any size at any location. I call it the Chinese hat syndrome. Here is new housing in Chengdu. And here is the Ministry of Communications building in Beijing. Now both these pictures show vertical buildings and yet both sport Chinese hats. This is no longer about shedding rain. This is all about reminding oneself that one is, after all, still Chinese. The other way the Chinese hat syndrome is expressed is much more significant. In fact, it may be one harbinger of any genuine indigenous style yet to come. It is this. New Chinese buildings have an irrepressible urge to resolve themselves with organic roof forms at the roof line. These gestures are almost always non-utilitarian, yet they are relatively expensive to build. Look at this building in Shanghai. The organic forms are over two stories above the rooftop levels, and compared to the windows of the individual housing units, they are enormous. Again, this is not about shedding rain. This is a contemporary manifestation of the historic organic Chinese roof, now rendered a decorative gesture. The prevalence of organic forms atop tall buildings in China, and maybe some of them like this one, are more scarf-like than hat-like, is truly a unique feature of new Chinese architecture. The next time you're in China, take note of those hats and scarves because they come from a long stylistic history. One result of the influx of Western ideas into China is fixation upon single buildings as individual expressions, often quite independent of what is going on around them. The new Shanghai Museum is built to look like an ancient Chinese ritual vessel, complete with handles. Not to be outdone, a department store on a Chengdu street corner is built to look like a cruise ship, complete with anchors. This look at me individualism does not come from native roots. It is imported. And this fact, in conjunction with lack of a theoretical tradition to guide how these objects should look, results in all sorts of amazing forms. Because the average Chinese has historically been so place-bound, the far away has always seemed magical. Not surprisingly, this is reflected in the new architecture. Here are new Vaux-Riche housing units along a freeway on the outskirts of Hanzhou, a large city near Shanghai. What is going on here? Gingerbread trim, vaguely Victorian gables, steeple-like roofs, a widow's walk. I call it postcard chic. It's a grab bag of different motifs from faraway places. Greetings from Hanzhou. Wishing you were here. Or probably more accurately, wishing I am anywhere but here. China today is certainly not walled off from the outside world. But that doesn't mean the Chinese worldview has been liberated from what I call a wall mentality. Again, a small dose of Chinese philosophy. In the classical Chinese worldview, everything inside the wall is family, while everything outside of the wall is not family. The traditional Chinese courtyard house was surrounded by a wall. Chinese cities were also always walled. Go to China today and company headquarters, schools and universities, apartment complexes, parks, all of these tend to be surrounded by walls. And then of course there's the Great Wall. The wall is an enormous factor in the Chinese psyche. My point here is that this wall mentality is not conducive to the generation of coherent urban plans. It most negatively affects in-between public spaces, sidewalks, plazas, green spaces, in short, spaces that precisely because they are publicly shared do not fall within the wall of any family identity. Shown here is an alleyway in a residential district of Quinming in southern China. Note the garbage simply dumped against the wall. Now granted, this is not a new area of Quimming, 
nor is it a wealthy one. But the truth is that this picture, alas, is quite representative of a larger attitude towards public spaces. And Chinese cities suffer because of this. Consider, in a country that has valued oneness with nature for millennia, Chinese cities today are some of the most polluted in the world. In sum, all of these ingredients make for a new and energetic, if not frenetic, Chinese urban architecture. Among the stylist ingredients are architectural themes and gestures from all over the world, and they mix with the historic Chinese experience to produce, let us say, a new kind of architectural chop suey.